Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Oh, y'all can do better than that. How y'all doing today? Well, let me just say that you look good. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Pastor Nate, so much for giving me the opportunity to preach today. Uh, how many college football fans do I have in here? Yeah? We got just a handful, a few of you guys are. Who do y'all root for? Anybody? Nobody? Uh, in college football? College football? Penn State? We are Penn State. What is it? If you had to, I wouldn't if I had to. No, no doubt. Uh, last night I was watching the uh, LSU game. I'm a huge LSU fan, and they were playing Auburn. And I was sitting there, and I was screaming and yelling at the TV. They were down by 17 in the first half, and I was just mad. I was telling, I was like, we need to replace everybody on the whole team. I'm sitting there, and then they come back to win the game. And I was sitting there with Preston, and he's like my little football buddy, or at least I thought he was. He, we were sitting there, and we're watching the game, and I thought it was really cool. I mean, he's two, and he's sitting there, and he's like talking about it. He's like, yeah, I'm seeing a ball. I'm like, I know, he dropped it, right? Like, we're just sitting there talking. And I'm thinking that he's excited about the football game until uh, somebody got hurt and they had to get carted off the field. And they brought a, a cart on the field and he stands up and starts screaming and he's going, vroom, vroom, vroom. If y'all don't know this about Preston, he loves cars. Like, like they are his favorite thing. He'll talk to you about cars. He'll play with his cars. And like yesterday we were at lunch and I took his car away and he proceeded to use his hand like it was a car. <laughs> like he's doing his thing. And I'm just starting to realize that maybe uh, football isn't his favorite thing because it seems to just be in his nature that he loves cars. It's a lot of fun. Like we're walking down the street and he gets excited every time we see a car. Like, vroom, vroom. I'm like, yeah. We took a 17-hour road trip not too long ago. And he's like, Daddy, Daddy. I'm like, yeah, Preston. Vroom, there's a vroom. I'm like, yes, we're on the road. It's the highway. Oh, it's driving me crazy. It's just something that's in his nature. It's like with our dog, Marvel. I don't know if uh, I brought him around a couple times when he was little, even when he was like this, but now he's like up to here on me. And there, I've had some dogs that... I was, able, I was able to train to not get my food when I leave it. And then I have failed miserably with Marvel. Like I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. A few weeks ago I had a hamburger and this was a good hamburger. Like it, it, it was juicy, it was medium and I had some barbecue sauce, some jalapenos on it. Mm, hallelujah, there, I, there was cheese and it was delicious. I was so excited about this hamburger. I hadn't had breakfast this morning yet so I might be going in a little too strong here but I was so excited about this thing and I, I, I pulled it out and I, put, I made it, put it on my plate, got it looking all nice and then I went to the restroom and when I came back, it was disappeared. It was like a magic trick, completely gone. And so I grabbed my newspaper and I started chasing Marvel around the house. And, and then it wasn't just two, two days later that I got a, some breakfast and I made my bacon and I had I ate all my bacon on the way over to the, and I had my toast, ate my bacon and I had three eggs sitting on my plate. And I went upstairs to get my phone because I don't learn my lesson. And I come downstairs and I go into my office and I look and my three eggs were now two eggs. And this is Marvel. Like won't look at me, won't, won't make eye contact at all. He's like just sitting here and I was like, what is this? It takes off running. And I could have gotten mad again, but I just decided to accept it. That like, that's just a part of his nature. And a lot of times whenever we're talking about the Lord, we talk about the things that he does, but we don't talk about enough the things that he is, the things that make him up. Like God is love. He is compassion. He has all of these things that are in his nature that project him, that are able for us to be able to come to him. We'll be able to see them in action. There are, he's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's all powerful. Like these are things, y'all know the difference between nature, uh, uh, what's in their nature and something someone does? Like it's something that makes them up. And uh, something I want to talk to you about today is that our God is not just all of those things. He's not just all powerful, omniscient, omnipresent, but he is also Jehovah Nisi, the one that reigns in victory. He is Jehovah Nisi. Now, the thing about that is the fact that he reigns in victory, it's not just that he wins victories. It's the fact that he is victorious. It's who he is. 
And I want to remind you of that today because I've been hearing a whole lot of people, I've been talking to a whole lot of people that they seem to have just this outlook of like everything is so bad. Right? Oh, there, there's so much darkness out there. You had conversations like that? There, that? There's so much wickedness. There's so much of this thing. It's just too hard. The economy is too rough. There's too much inflation. That my kids are acting crazy. I'm not too sure to, what to do about my marriage. I don't know what to do about my job. I don't know how I'm going to get out of my current situation that I'm in. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. And I have all these conversations with people. And I feel like I just need to remind you today that our God sits on a throne of victory, that he is victorious. He is already that way, regardless of what you have. Sometimes all it takes is us taking our eyes off of the situation we're in and putting them on the Lord to overcome something. That you stop staring at your problem. You say, you know what? My God is exactly who he says he is. We have this image of uh, the Lord in Isaiah 6.1, and it's one of my favorite passages of, of Scripture because it's Isaiah being called into uh, becoming a prophet and going out into the land, and we get this clear image of the Lord and what he looks like. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord high and exalted and seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I want somebody to underline that part right there that his train of his robe had filled the temple. And then we get this image of two different angels that are flying around and that they are covering their flesh and they're crying out. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the earth is filled with this glory. And it says that the uh, doorposts were shaken from them crying this out. And then we go into this and the Lord ends up calling Isaiah to be our prophet. But what I wanted to pay, draw your attention to here is right there where it said the train of his robe filled the temple. You know why this is so important? This is the image that uh, the Lord gives to Isaiah. And in Isaiah's day, something very important would happen whenever a king would conquer another king. He would then take his robe the, of the conquered king, and he would nail it or sew it to the back of his robe, and it became added onto his train. The train of his robe would continue to grow the more a king would conquer. So what would happen is this king would conquer two or three lands, and his robe would start coming out to here. And then the other king would come and conquer him, and all of those victories would be added under his belt onto his train. And I thought it was very important to point out the fact that when Isaiah sees the Lord here, he doesn't just have a small train that's going. He has one that completely fills the temple around. And it's not because the Lord has just won all these victories. It's because it's an image of who the Lord is, that he is victorious. I want you to get this in whatever's happening, that the Lord is victory. He is victorious and he will not lose a battle. Never has lost a battle, and he's never going to do so. So I'm going to continue in Isaiah here. That uh, in Isaiah 59, 19, and this will be our base scripture for today. And this is a scripture that has been on my mind for weeks. I have not been able to get past it, and so I'm so excited to speak on it and teach on it today. It uh, says, So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, somebody say flood. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he will lift up a standard against him. Another way of saying this, when he comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will put them to flight. I just want to show you for a minute my, when I'm studying scripture, how I go about it. What I usually do is whenever there's a scripture I'm having a difficulty understanding or want further clarification in, I'll, I'll read all of the different translations of it, right? I'll look at this one and I'll go through that. And then from there, I'll go into the Greek or the Hebrew, see what the definitions are. And then I will go into the other places in scripture, those same words are used, right? So it's not just a definition of it, but a biblical context, when I was studying this scripture in particular, this uh, word here, I, it's uh, no si sa, which I'm probably butchering, but it's how it's spelled, as this uh, Hebrew word. And the problem I ran into was that it was only used in one place in all of scripture, and it's right here. When it's talking about the standard being raised up against the enemy. 
that it, it literally means to like drive or the Holy Spirit is going to drive something that is gonna come up and overcome. Now, the thing is, is that a whole lot of the time what we think about when we read this scripture, we say, you know what? That the uh, enemy is gonna come in like a flood. They're gonna do something crazy. They're gonna come in with these attacks and the Lord is going to come in with a stand that he's going to match that attack, Right? Right? He's going to counter that attack or block it. Do an old video game like Mortal Kombat. He's going to block whatever that thing was. Right? And I, it's a misimage of what's happening here because the Lord doesn't just block an attack that's coming in. He doesn't just raise up to whatever that is. The standard that he raised up is usually a group of people that completely overcome to make him victorious because it's who he is. No say saw here. That he's gonna put it to flight, that the Holy Spirit drives, and I'm gonna go deeper into that in just a few seconds. But um, I, I, as I was going through this, since I just had that one, I started looking, reading into different uh, commentaries, and I came across one from Spurgeon. Are y'all familiar with C.S. Spurgeon? Yeah, so I, I came across one with him, and it was very interesting. And I want to just read from it for a second here before we really get into my message. And he's talking about this scripture, and he says, it says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit shall lift up a standard against him. It says, there will be a most terrible apostasy when the man of sin shall reach yet another greater development than at the present. And the Christian church shall be brought to its very lowest ebb. At such time, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard for the truth. A spirit, uh, and by the power of grace, the kingdom of Jesus shall be revealed in its fullest glory. We are not, however, inclined to interpret this text in a restricted manner as it's solely relating to one period of time. What this says to me is that this is almost like a cycle. From the beginning of time, so since the beginning of the church, the enemy has wanted, the devil has wanted nothing more to, to, to abolish the flame that is the church. Whenever it was just a baby, that there were schemes by Nebuchadnezzar to just completely destroy and wipe out anyone that would follow the Nazarene. And then right after him, there was Emperor Nero. How many of y'all have heard about Emperor Nero before? He was one of the most heinous people to ever live. This guy would literally light Christians on fire and use them as lamps at parties. That's how, that was the type of, um, that was the type of persecution that was coming against the early church. There were all of these things and all of these schemes, like uh, early on to it, we see James going into, uh, I'm sorry, Peter going into uh, prison and James is already slain with a sword. And then you have, uh, you had uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Nero in power and, and they're all being attacked by these uh, groups of people. And then you have the zealot, you have Saul of Tarsus coming in with this Pharisee and, uh, um, uh, this Pharisee and, Spirit, yeah, that, that's a good word for it, spirit, that he's coming to overtake and persecute. He's a thorn in their side. He's attacking them every place he can get, right? And then the Lord somehow turns all of those things, and it's almost like it was a fiery chariot for that early church. Thing after thing, miracle after miracle, the Holy Spirit showed up again and again and again, and they were able to turn these things, and attacks were thwarted, and the very person who was leading the t attack from the Pharisees ends up becoming a Christian himself, and uh, what's it's funny is that he was so about the law, and then he becomes an apostle to the Gentiles, which is great. I think it's just hilarious to me that he was so about the law there and then he turns full fledge around and starts going after the Gentiles. The Lord has a way of uh, coming against whatever the enemy is doing and putting it to bed. After that, you see the church going uh, flourishes for a while, then it, uh, the enemy changes his schemes and he starts attacking from within the church. And then you see things like the 95 Theses coming to the wall. We see different revivals. We see the holiness movement. We see different men and women of God, some that are known and some that uh, will receive an eternal reward for what they did. But constantly the enemy attacks and the Lord overthrows it. The enemy attacks, the church gets brought low and low and low, and then the Lord comes in in a mighty way, in a mighty wind, and raises up a standard against it. It's kind of like being an LSU fan, right? For the purpose of uh, my illustration here, you are all LSU fans, the church, all right? Right, so we'll, we'll win. We'll win a national championship. It happens. Like We'll win a national championship, and then all, all of a sudden, things start looking really bad, 
like out of nowhere. Y'all saw what happened a couple years ago? It was like best team in history. What happened, right? It was so, so bad. And uh, then um, we had teams like Alabama and, and uh, Georgia and Clemson, these different evil groups coming in, right, <laughs> to land. Right, they were coming in, and all this evil was taking over, and it was pressing. We're like, "What are we gonna do?" And then, out of nowhere, we end up winning another national champ. Like, it's gonna happen eventually. Like, eventually, that, that we are gonna win one. I prom- I believe so. Hallelujah. But <laughs> I, let's put this in terms of the church. Things start to get dark and weird and bad at times, and it seems to just like what I'm hearing from most of you now. That it seems like we're in a dark place. There's too much money being printed. There's too much this. The cost of everything. The cost of uh, uh, doing a ministry or running a, like, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Things seem to be at its lowest. People do not want to hear truth. They want you to sugarcoat everything to them, even though it's not going to lead to change. People think that just simple truth is now hatred. And there's all these attacks coming against And I want, if you hear anything today, hear this. This is the time as Christians, I believe we should be the most excited. Whenever things start looking like this is when the Lord does something miraculous and marvelous, that the Lord does something incredible and he comes out of nowhere and he comes in like the spirit of the Lord, like a wind, the wind of the Lord comes in and he meets evil with even greater light. He meets evil. He meets the schemes and the powers with something so extraordinary that it's going to be an amazing thing to see. I am getting excited because I know that there's a standard that's being raised up against the, uh, the schemes of the enemy. And what I want to tell you today, what I want you to get in your mind is that you are that standard. Hallelujah. Woo, yeah, thank you. You are that standard. Amen. Now, this is important. This is important. I'm going to show it to you, and we're, uh, I'll go deeper into it because I'm, a lot of you probably say, you know what? I hear you, Pastor, but I don't really, I don't really feel like that standard right now, right? Hey, you don't have to raise your hand. Never mind. <laughs> There's a couple things I want to go into, but uh, before doing so, I want, I want you to get this clear image of Jesus being the standard that was raised against and us becoming that standard in Jesus. In Colossians 2.15, it says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Jesus is our clearest image of a standard being raised up against the enemy. What he did, the schemes and the things that were going on uh, all around him, and him going to the cross, it says that he triumphed over these powers. He made that standard for us. He made it be, uh, us able to equip it. We see this in all of Scripture and uh, throughout humanity. Wherever there's something rising up and the Lord raises up a group or a person or a prophet or something against it. Uh, One of the times I can think of is like Ahab and Jezebel. You've got Elijah that comes forth and he comes and uh, the miraculous happens against him. And he takes a strong stance against all of these prophets of Baal and Jezebel and all this wicked that's standing there. And eventually through uh, as he passes it on to Elijah and they end up uh, destroying this entire group and the land is saved once again and started fearing the Lord. Another example would be Moses. Things look pretty bad for the Israelites, Right. They're in bondage, they're, they're slaves, and then the Lord raises up Moses and brings him from, from that land to this land, back to this land, and does the miraculous and sends all these signs and wonders that follow him so that they can come out of bondage and get to where they were supposed to go. In, in the New Testament, we could talk about Paul and, and um, Peter coming up. We can look in the Old Testament at Esther and the early church. There's all these things that are coming into place that the Lord is saying that whenever these things happen, whenever the Lord, it's this, I'm trying to equate it to, it seems like it's a flow. That the, in, the enemy gets defeated on this front, and then he changes his schemes, how he attacks, and the Lord raises up against it. And then he gets defeated over here in this season, and then he changes up how he's attacking. He tries to weasel him in, give an inch, take a mile, and then he comes up right here, and then the Lord overthrows him again and again and again. And it's a cycle that we're in. And when things look the worst around us is whenever the great and magnificent are about to happen around us, if we're just willing to say yes to the Lord. I'm telling you that this is something amazing that is about to take place and that we are about to raise up a standard. The way that I would equate it to you is like it's like Nebuchadnezzar's heating up in his furnace seven times over, right? 
that he's heating it up. It looks very terrible. And it's, there's all these things that are happening that are scaring people and getting people worried and getting them inside their own minds. And then we're gonna come out like a church. We're gonna go into that fire. We're gonna walk out. We're not even gonna smell like smoke because the miraculous is gonna happen through it. The group that uh, doesn't feel like the stand, uh, well, which most of us at one point in our life or another didn't feel like we were the standard. And I want to talk to you guys, and, but I, before we do that, I want to make sure that we get this fact that you were not good enough to begin with, all right? Came here to encourage you today, right? He says that he, he was... Um, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it said, For he made him who, know, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we are the righteousness of God in Jesus. I don't want you thinking, as I'm about to talk about what I'm about to talk about, I don't want you thinking that there is, I don't know how to, that more that you have to do, more pressure you have to put in yourself. It's something that's revealed in you as you start pursuing the Lord, that it's Christ in you that is the hope of glory. And I want you to get this because I'm about to talk about a whole lot of things that you got to do, but I want to make it clear and evident to you that he already did it. Now it's just time for us to get out of our own way. That every, all the victory was already won at Calvary. Now it's just time for us to say, yes, Lord, whatever you have for me. And then they continue to do that whenever it doesn't look like it's working out at all. It, that scripture from earlier in Isaiah 59, 19, when I was saying that it's the wind of the Lord that drives, that's a literal definition. I was going to put it up here, but I forgot to put it in the PowerPoint. It, the literal definition is the wind of the Lord that drives. When you're talking about the standard coming up, it is the spirit of the Lord that is going to drive this. You do not have to be that standard by yourself. Those, you just have to listen to the spirit of the Lord when he's telling you to do things. So there's two groups of people I want to talk to today when we're talking about the standard. The first is a group that just needs to say yes. I said yes, and I love it. And I think that you should too. The scripture says that many are called, but few are chosen. And this is a scripture that has had bothered me for years. I was like, he said, many are called. I'm like, yeah, but I'm preaching. But few are chosen. I'm like, well, okay. Right? It's kind of hard something. It's a difficult something to relay. And I remember whenever I was first got married, my first year of marriage, I was working at this publishing company. And there's these guys that worked in, I worked in marketing and I was doing sales there. And there's these guys that worked in book sales. I can't remember their name right now, but I sat here in my cubicle and they sat there and I would talk to them over the cubicle all the time. And I remember one time I was sitting in the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, kitchen there, and one of them came through, and he was looking for some, to help somebody move. I mean, he was looking for somebody to help him move. And let me tell you something about me. The only thing I hate more than moving is helping other people move, right? I can't stand it. I hate the whole entire process. I have rules set up so that you can't ask me to help you to move, all right? All right there's certain rules that I have to follow. The first one is I'm not going to help you move more than one time in a two-year period, you can't, if you don't resign that lease, it's on you, buddy. It is what it is. Like, I'm, that ain't me. I'm not, I don't want to. And you also, you got to have pizza or something for me to eat. I'm not going to go out there working hard, blood sugar be dropping and junk, and you just out there in your air conditioning packing your boxes. Actually, that's the other one. Your stuff has to be packed before I come. All right? I am not packing your stuff and moving it. You get one or the other. All right? I don't like to move. So here he is going through. He's like, anybody want to help me move? I'm doing this. I'm like Marvel with the sandwich. No, no, can't, can't make eye contact to it. And it seems like everybody's doing that. A lot of people probably have the same strong feelings about moving that I do. And I'll never forget this guy that was sitting next to me. He's going around asking everybody, and it's getting awkward and weird at some, this point. And this guy raises his hand. He goes, hey, I'll, I'll help you move. And the guy turns around and he says, oh, then I choose you. Being funny. But in that moment, I got an image of exactly what this scripture means, the, that the many are called, but few are chosen. Each and every single one of you are called to be this standard. Each and every one of you are called to be uh, the righteousness of God or called to walk into the fullness of Christ. The difference is, is that whenever you raise your hand and you say, you know what, I'll do it. I'll be the one that I'll, I'll, I'll do what the Lord has for me. 
I'll, I'll step out in faith, even though it doesn't make any sense. That's when the Lord turns around and says, I'll, I choose you then. I choose you. I see it in that scripture in Isaiah 6 that I spoke about earlier. We had the, the uh, angels singing out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And if we jump to uh, verse 5 there, it's, uh, he gets a touch from the altar. It says the angels drew a came and got a coal from the altar and touched it to his lips. And it said that your sin was atoned for. And from there, he says, woe to me. I cried, for I am a oh yeah, for I am a man of unclean lips. I have lived among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then this atonement from the altar takes place. And then in verse in verses six and seven, in verse eight, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah in that moment became one of the uh, got the anointing of one of the greatest prophets to ever live. And it was simply because the Lord said, who is going to do it? Who's going to do it? Who's going to step out? And Isaiah was saying, here I am. Because he, he, the truth is, is he got a touch from the altar, and that's something that'll give you boldness. Whenever you're able, there's a direct correlation between righteousness and boldness. Can I just tell you that? I'm not trying to throw you on the bus for anything. I think that uh, the, we are all working our walk out in fear and trembling. But I tell you what, there is, if you feel like you're struggling with something, there's few better places to be than a, here at the altar. Because if you get a touch whenever you're worshiping the Lord, when the Lord's presence comes in, he has a way of making things right that don't seem to be right. It's atoned for. And so he comes out and he says, here I am, send me. We see with the, Paul, the call of Paul as well. He's on the road to Damascus. He's going to a meeting with the Jewish leaders there. And he's knocked off his horse. And, and he says, why are you persecuting me? And uh, uh, Jesus calls out to him. And he says, I don't know, even know who you are. Who are you? And the, uh, Jesus explains it. And his response was, what do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do? And then Paul decides to do it. And he goes after it. The opposite of this is true too. The Lord puts calls on people's lives that they walk away from. Elijah that I spoke about earlier didn't finish going after his call, so he had to anoint another one after him. Saul, the first king of Israel, Saul was called to be this glorious king and the Lord was gonna show mighty things through him. And then David, a shepherd boy, rose up and took that mantle from him because he was, didn't do what the Lord had asked him to do. This is important to me because uh, what I'm saying right now, and I, didn't, I went back and forth on whether or not I was going to go into this, but I decided to, so lucky y'all, right? <laughs> the Lord, there is never a moment in your life that it's too late. There's never a moment in your life that the Lord is not willing to give you retribution and, and to, to make right of any, any wrong that's happened in your life or any path. There's no such thing as a lost cause with the Lord. No such thing at all, and I want to make that clear. But I tell you what, the way that the Lord operates is he's looking to and fro to show himself mighty in the strong and in a believer, right? That he is operating, he's just looking for people that are willing to say yes and that aren't going to stop saying yes. I'm going to say that again. It's not just the first time whenever you are at the altar here or, or you feel, feel the spirit of the Lord so strong and you say yes, it's every moment after that that the Lord wants you to keep saying yes so that he can see what he's able to trust you with. I'll, I'll attribute to, how many of you guys played football? I'm staying on this today for some reason. Did you ever do two-a-days? Two-a-days? You no, know, uh, summertime? Florida? Hot. It's hot, all right? You got your helmet on, you're hitting, doing a bunch of stuff you're not even supposed to be allowed to do during the summer, but the coaches don't care. You're training, you're running around, you're acting crazy. And this happened every single year. And I don't know why I would always be surprised of how exhausted I was by the end of summer camp for football. Man, you would get up early in the morning and go and you do practice and you work hard, give it your all, and you'd be gone for like an hour and then back, you got to do it all over again. And there's something that would happen there. There was something that would happen on that field during those times. There would be a bond that was built between this team, uh, that everyone was there. But something else that always happened too, people would quit. It, it, it was what it was. I feel like the reason that they went so hard on us in the summer is that when it came August, when it came game time, the people that were willing to quit were not going to be there because the Lord, the Lord, the coach, 
Y'all see where I'm going with this? The coach was not willing to, uh, would not be willing to put, didn't want to put somebody in a position where there was still some quit left in them. That they were going to go through this, but we went, so they would take every ounce of blood, sweat, and tears. We would work so hard, and then it meant something for us to be able to stand up and go into that season, that we would be able to stand up and go into that stadium at the beginning of the year. What would happen is people would quit, people would get uh, yelled at, people would get, um, but also people would get positions, and people would get named tag captains, and people would give them responsibilities that were put forth from them as soon as that testing period was over, as soon as the season was ready to start. Back to our base scripture, that a standard's being raised up. I believe a lot of you are in a season right now where you don't understand what is going on. You don't know why it's going on. You don't understand what it looks like. You don't know why you got that report from the doctor. You don't know why your job is happening like that. You don't know why that you don't seem to be able to pay your bills. You don't know why your family's acting that way. Your kids are acting crazy. Some of y'all are suction cup to your seat right now. All right. You don't know why these things are happening to you. And let me tell you just something right now, that the Lord, it says in Scripture that the Lord tests you and he refines you. Like silver or gold. Zechariah 13, 9 says, And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. And they will call upon my name. And I will answer them, and I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is my God. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 so, says, so that the tested genuineness, somebody say genuineness, genuineness, of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through the tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 48.10, behold, I have refined you. But not as silver, I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. A lot of times we start looking at our situation, our circumstance, the things that are going on around us. And we say, you know what, I I don't know why this would be. All I have done is say yes to the Lord. Sometimes I feel like the spirit of the Lord is strong and mighty within me. And other times I feel like when I'm praying, it's bouncing off the ceiling. Y'all know what I'm saying? Yeah, y'all know what, and I say, you know what, I don't understand, like, I feel like I got called into this, I feel like the Lord spoke this to me, it was so clear, I done called everybody and told them how this was going to go, and now it's not going any way like the way I said it was going to go, out here looking silly, I don't feel like it's really flowing, I thought that I would be flowing this way, or this would be happening, or it would be looking like this, I put so much into it, let me just encourage you today, That the Lord is nothing if he is not faithful. And he is nothing if he is not victorious. And I tell you right now that you are being tested in a genuineness of faith. You are being tested that no matter what it looks like, you know what faith is? A thing seen as if they were, while they were unseen. That's what faith is. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter how it's going on around you. What matters is the Lord says he is who he says he is and whether or not you're gonna continue to press on toward the things he has for you. In Genesis 11, how many of y'all are familiar with uh, Terah? He's the uh, father of Abram. How many of you are familiar with Abram? Uh, Okay, yeah. It's kind of the point that I wanna get to in this. And again, I wasn't sure. I have all these like sub markers, like maybe I might talk, but we're going to go and go in on this as well. (laughs) Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, this is the account of Terah's family line. And then it goes through, it talks about Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and the Haran being the father of Lot. And it talks about Sarai and Sarai not being able to have children. It goes through all of these things in these few uh, scriptures. I think it's like 27 through 30. It's at, now 30 says, now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. And now it says, Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, and his son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Yor of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived two, and then this is the last thing it says about him, Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. 
he says that he went to, child to go to Canaan. And now let's fast forward to Genesis 12 right there. It says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. It says in verse four, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran, the same place that Terah had left him. And he took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions, all of these things, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. That's verse 6, and I want you to see in verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to, him, said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord. I'm reading between the lines here, all right? But I believe that the Lord intended for Terah to be the father of our faith. Now, just hear me out, and this is conjecture on my part. I don't, I don't want to just preach this as all, all out, but I truly believe this. And the reason that is, is because Tara is a successful person where he's at. He's successful. It says they had to gather all his possessions. He had his family. He had all of these things. He's sitting in your, uh, the Chaldeans. And then out of nowhere, it says he picks up his stuff. He grabs all of his family, everything they have, and then they head out to Canaan, right? This is the account of it, that he's going to Canaan. And then it says, Terah took his son from your, to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And they lived there 205 years, and he died in Haran. And that's what we know about Terah. And then we see him come to Abram right there, and he calls him. He says, will you go to Canaan? He says, I'm going to take you to this land where you don't know. And Abram just decides, he says, yes, I'll go where you say I should go. And then he goes into Canaan, and as soon as he arrives to the place that Terah was trying to get to, the Lord comes to him and says, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. All I'm trying to get to with this is the fact that you can be on your journey and you can be being refined and you can have all these things that are happening around you, but I don't want you to settle where you're at. I don't want you to stop walking toward exactly what the Lord called you to do. I don't want you to stop walking toward the ministry he wants you to start. I don't want you to stop walking toward what he wants you to speak. I don't want you to stop walking toward the miracles and the signs and wonders that are going to follow a group of people that are willing to say, I'm not going to do what everybody else is going to do. I'm going to do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. Even if it's over and beyond even if it doesn't make any sense in my natural body. And even, and even more so that I have stepped, even when you have already said yes to that, if you haven't said yes to that, I want you to say yes to that. But when you already have done that and everything seems like it's falling apart around you, I want to encourage you today that the Lord is who reigns in victory, that he is going to be victorious and he is never going to call you into something that he is not going to come out the other side and say, look what we were able to do. Look what I was able to do through you because through those other seasons when you felt like giving up, you said, you know what? It doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter any of these things. It matters who he is and what he did. Did. I want to encourage you that if you are on this walk right now and it doesn't feel right, I doesn't matter at all because how you feel in your season, how you feel in your moment, how you feel in your journey does not change who the Lord is and what he's going to do in your life. It doesn't change the promise that you got. It doesn't change the promise that you got, what the Lord spoke to you. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It doesn't matter how it looks around you. It doesn't matter the finances or how much money they're printing. That does not matter. What matters is the Lord said he wants to use you. He said that many are called and few are chosen. I want you to be the few chosen because in this season and in this moment, you say, no matter what, I'm making my decision today that I'm going to stand in faith tomorrow, no matter what tomorrow has. And then tomorrow, I'm going to say the same thing again. I'm going to stand in faith tomorrow tomorrow whenever that other thing comes because I know that the Lord is here with me now whether I feel him or not that's what I want you to get today that God is who he says he is and he is victorious it's in his nature the train of his robe fills the temple and we just need to grab a hold of that with whatever you've got going on and I know that the Lord placed this on my heart today whatever your season is whatever it looks like it does not matter what matters is who he is. If you just uh, bow your heads and close your eyes really quick as I'm closing in this. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here today. I thank you for 
given them ears to hear, Father, and I pray that you would just, whatever you had for them, there was a lot said today, whatever you had for them and they grabbed a hold of, that you would just cement it in their heart, Father, that, that they would be able to listen to you and your Holy Spirit. There's two groups I want to talk to today, and I've already talked about them and, and preached about it today. But the first is you would say, you know what, I have never said that yes. And maybe it's not, you never said yes to the Lord for the first time. Or maybe it's that you haven't said yes to going after the supernatural that is the Lord. To going after the things that he has for you. It's going after the, the things that he wants you to do more than what the ordinary is, but the extraordinary that God is. And you want to say, you know what, I haven't done that, but I want to say yes today. I want to say yes, whatever you have for me, Lord. I'm going to set out my, I'm going to start my journey here. Whatever you have for me, Father, I'm going to put aside what I've got in my life. I'm going to put aside whatever things I am worried about. I'm just going to have faith and I'm going to stand up and say, you know what, the things that the Lord has for me are so much better. If this is you, could you just slip up your hand right up, right down right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to take a moment and cement that in you, that, that you're deciding to, that right now it's not just going to be a come in and go out type thing, that you're going to go after full force exactly what the Lord has for you. And there's a second group of people I wanted to talk to. You'd say, I said yes, and sometimes I feel like I regret it. Just being real. I said yes, and I know I'm not supposed to say that, but I feel a little bit worn down. I feel a little bit beat down right now, and I don't feel like things are going the way that the Lord intended them for me. I want to talk to this group, and the reason I want to talk to you is I want you today to make up in your mind that the Lord is nothing if he's not victorious, and he's nothing if he's not faithful. And I want your faith to go from where it's at to the top of a mountain right now. And you'd say, I understand that I'm in this season so that you can trust me, that the genuineness of my faith will come shine through. And I, let me just promise you this too, that if you stay strong right here in this season and in this moment, what the Lord has for you on the other side of it is glorious. It's amazing. It's amazing that at one moment you can be one place and the next you can be complete, somewhere completely different because that's how the Lord operates. If you say today, I feel a little bit beat down and I want my faith to grow. I want to make a commitment that I'm, and that's your responsibility. Let me just say that too. All in scripture, well, you see Jesus rebuking the disciples for the same thing over and over. He says, you have little faith, you have little faith, you have little faith. Let me just tell you that it's on you where your faith level is at. And so I want you to make a public commitment right now that you're gonna change where your faith level is at. Anybody that say, you know what, when you're praying for somebody, pastor, pray for me. Just slip up your hands, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your faith is gonna rise so much right now in this moment. Let me pray for each one of you that, Lord, I pray for those that responded to the first call, that they said they're saying yes to Jesus, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it is, that they wanna see you show up in a mighty, mighty way in their lives, Father. So I pray that you start to move on them right now. You start to move on their heart, that you begin to shift things and to, to drop things, that things begin to fall off them like they never even knew, and that they'd be able to walk in such freedom and with such abundance, and they would have such blessing on their lives. And Lord, I pray for the second group of people that they are able to keep their eyes on you and they're able to know exactly who you are, Father, no matter how it looks around them. They're saying, I'm gonna stay steadfast because the enemy is coming in like a flood right now. And I know that I know that I know that a glorious church is gonna rise out of it. That well, I'm, gonna be a, I'm choosing to be a part of this standard no matter what it looks like around me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to uh, uh, welcome Pastor Nate to the stage as we're beginning to close our service. Thank you guys so much for having me today. I really enjoyed being able to preach. Amen. Didn't he do a great job? <clears throat> Someone told me that earlier that Pastor Jordan is just getting better and better. And uh, he's always been good, but uh, he is just growing and maturing in the Lord and speaking to us. Amen. I was planning on, on sharing today. I'm about 80%. I've lost my voice, uh, but I'm doing a lot better. Next week, I just feel led of the Lord to begin a series that's entitled, What is this world coming to? And uh, we're going to look at end time events and uh, things that are in the news. 
And I want to challenge you to be here. Uh, it's going to be a short series. I know we went through the book of Revelation over about a two-year period. So this isn't going to be a two-year series. Just uh, kind of we're going to hit the bullet points. But I want to invite you to be here. Invite a friend. This is a very important series. How many know that we are living in the last days? And I believe that the Lord is coming soon. And uh, scripture is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. And so I want to challenge you to come, uh, bring your notebook. We're going to dive into the Word of God. And uh, in this series, it will be fascinating as we uncover what the Word of God says. Amen? You know, when Pastor Jordan was talking, it just reminded me of Joshua. Joshua was, was in a very tumultuous time, and he came to a place where he said to all of Israel, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to tell you today that is so relevant to you and, and to me. We need to have that same tenacity to be able to stand up in this world and say, as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. When you put God first in your life, He will take care of you. Don't look at the circumstances. Sometimes the circumstances will forsake you. But God will never forsake those who put their trust in Him. Amen? Amen.